What do you guys think about the the new backdrop here? I decided to do a little bit of updating. I'll throw another just photo on the screen now what the backdrop looks like. I think it looks pretty sweet, but what do you think? Hey everybody and welcome back. So this is day three of a week long series of content that I'm doing for the channel. We're doing MH3 commanders, topic videos, and at the very end of it, we're doing a mass sort of compendium of all of my commander decks that I've made the last couple of years in a ranked tier list. It's going to be a long video. It's going to be a sweet one. So make sure that you tune in and stick around for all the videos that I'll be making this entire week. But without further ado, let's get into this next commander. So truthfully, I think I sort of made a monster here. So the Necro Bloom is a new commander that's come out in the Modern Horizons 3 set. It is a four mana commander, one and then Abzan colors. So white, black, green. I guess I passed my test. And then I just have to review the stats here. It's a two power seven toughness creature that has landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield under your control, you make a zero one green plant creature token. Synergy with Avenger of Zendikar, I guess. And if you control seven or more lands with different names, you make a two two black zombie instead. Now, for those of you that don't already know, Field of the Dead is a card that exists and is very prolific in a lot of different commander pods. It basically is this exact same effect. If there is seven or more lands in play of different names, importantly, you make a 2-2 zombie if Field of the Dead is on the battlefield. This effectively does the same thing, but it's even better because we get plants before that happens. And as I mentioned, the plants do have some minor synergy in the deck. Like for instance, Avenger of Zendikar, which we're running in our list, makes plants and then landfall buffs the plants, which Avenger of Zendikar is on the battlefield. But that's really a very minor thing to point out. The next ability actually, to me, is the most enticing, and that is land cards in your graveyard have Dredge 2. Now, Dredge 2 is an older mechanic. Famously, it is a busted mechanic. It is disgusting. The cards that allow you to dredge in place of a draw typically are... Uh, what's the right word? Format warping. Let's use that one. And in our circumstance, it's not just the commander that we're running dredge with. We have plenty of other cards in the deck which have dredge stapled onto them, such as a life for the loam, for instance, which is probably one of the better cards in our deck. But just the ability to recycle lands into your hand and just mill things into the graveyard off of any draw is really good. And I think that's the important thing to point out here. It's off of any draw it's not just your first draw per turn we also get the dredge if we draw extra cards on our turn even anything past the initial one as long as we have lands in our graveyard now we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into this commander today discussing a lot of the really powerful includes and the things that are going to make your deck tick and you can thank Richard for this deck. Richard has been a longtime viewer of the channel and recently sent me an email regarding the Necro Bloom. I was thinking about building it already, but Richard, you really were the one that inspired me to make this deck. And moreover, you inspired me to make multiple decks. So in the description down below, you are gonna find two versions of the Necro Bloom. One of them is the more high powered version. That's the one that I did most of my testing on with this deck. And I didn't need a lot of testing to understand just how crazy that that high powered list is. And then there's also a more budgetary list around 150 or less US dollars. I tried to keep it about 100 bucks, but it's kind of hard in like a landfall lands matter deck just because there's so many good lands for us to include. And I think maybe that's what we should start with. Let's talk about the land base before we move into anything else. So as mentioned, I do have a Field of the Dead in the more pricey version of this deck list. And Field of the Dead is really just extra backup, but also in just crazy ways, it acts as sort of like this additional win con in our deck in the event that our commander gets removed and we don't have the ability to make zombies off of our commander. Now there's a lot of combos in the deck with Field of the Dead, namely things like Splendid Reclamation that bring cards, the land specifically back from our graveyard into play all at once, and cards like Scape Shift. So for those of you that aren't aware, Scape Shift is a four mana sorcery that lets you sacrifice any number of lands, and then you go into your deck and get that number of lands from your deck onto the battlefield. And of course, if you have a way to untap them, like a Spelunking or Amulet of Vigor, it gets even better. But really what ends up happening here, if you aren't familiar with the interaction, is that you sacrifice everything except for your Field of the Dead if it's on the battlefield. And then you just get to dump all of your extra lands onto the board. And because they're all entering simultaneously, Field of the Dead is actually going to trigger for every single one, not just the ones over seven unique lands. 
it is pretty insane and that combo tends to end games very quickly especially with some of the other effects that we have in the deck like our overruns and also other synergy pieces with our tokens to generate accessory value on top of just basically closing the game out it's a really good card and i think field of the dead is just one of those pieces that I mean, not only thematically fits into this deck, but just really puts in a ton of work for us. But let's talk about a couple other interesting lands that we've included. So I wanted to make this deck really as mean as possible. And my God, <laughs> let me tell you a couple stories. So Glacial Chasm. If you aren't familiar with Glacial Chasm, let's review that right now. So Glacial Chasm is a land. It's a specialty land. It does not tap for mana unless you have something else on the battlefield that allows you to do so. It has a cumulative upkeep of pay to life. And then whenever it comes into play, so ETB, sacrifice a land. You cannot attack, but all damage dealt to you is reduced to zero. So Glacial Chasm is uh, another one of the famous lands. And it's a bit salt inducing because you can basically present near infinite loops with Glacial Chasm, whereupon during your upkeep, you can decide like once you've made it through a full turn cycle, decide to just sacrifice it and not pay the two life, replay it out of the graveyard with one of your effects like Ram and Amp Excavator or Crucible of Worlds, sacrifice another land, floating the mana off of it. Typically, it's another land that you want to get some more value off of, for instance, and then you can just continuously cycle this Glacial Chasm, basically locking the game out for everybody else because you're not going to be really paying any life to have this effect because typically there's a lot of cards in this deck that I've included where you can play multiple lands every turn. And speaking of playing multiple lands every turn, we should talk about Strip Mine. So if you're not familiar with the Strip Lock... Uh, welcome to the Necro Bloom. So I purposely included Strip Mine in here. I thought about including Wasteland, but I, my groups that I plan, it's just way too mean to have multiple ways for me to just get there, so to speak. So I only put in Strip Mine. If you want to put in a Wasteland as well to really just cement to your opponents that you are a full landfall degenerate, then I think it's great. And this is why. So if you have some effect to play it from the graveyard, let's I've had this happen multiple times, by the way, a Ramanap Excavator, let's say, on the battlefield, you play your strip mine, and then you sack it, destroying somebody's land, goes into the graveyard. Now, here's the thing. Typically in our deck, like I mentioned, we have a lot of ways to play additional lands on our turns. This is where the quote-unquote strip lock comes in. Typically what you can do, especially in pods where people are requiring or need additional colors of their lands, like dual lands, etc., you target those out first, you eliminate their access to those colors by destroying the lands, you keep replaying it out of the graveyard with your additional land effects per turn, and then effectively, as long as you can play at least three lands per cycle, the game comes to an absolute halt because you are still able to progress your board state with your lands, and if you need to, you can always play an additional land while still strip locking at least two other players out of the game. It's disgusting. I've won multiple games like this. It's a definitely more of a degenerate combo, but again, it is a win condition in the deck. Being able to play Strip Mine four times or three times a turn effectively in the early game means that the game ends pretty much every time, unless somebody has stifle effects or they have some other way to interact and remove a lot of the pieces that are allowing you to do that, such as get rid of your Ramanap Excavator or Crucible of Worlds. But in my experience, if you hit it early enough, people tend to not have that cheaper interaction available to them because they haven't had a chance to draw enough cards and you're eliminating their resources to allow them to draw more cards. Therefore, again, you basically grind the game to a halt. Uh, typically, people end up scooping against this. And if you don't want that type of play experience, leave out the Wasteland, leave out the Strip Mine. If you're going for the meanest possible build, though, I've made it for you. So check out the Necro Bloom higher budget deck in the description below. That was long-winded. We're going to be a little bit more concise on this next one. So Westvale Abbey. This is a card that I've been really hot on lately, especially in decks that can abuse it, such as the Necro Bloom, because we're going to be making a lot of zombie tokens or plants or whatever. And being able to sort of have... A a threat on a land is pretty sweet. If you're not familiar with it, you can basically pay five mana, sacrifice five creatures, and then you flip it or tap it and then flip it and you get this Prince of Undeath. It's like a 9-7 flying haste, crazy life linker. And typically it's just another way to help you stabilize, especially if people have been attacking you for most of the game. Having a swing of a nine life, even in a commander game, turns out is really, really good. 
And I've actually been quite impressed by this card because people don't expect it. Most people are, don't even know, at least in my playgroup, what Westvale Abbey even is. So being able to play it and then really surprise them out of nowhere with like a 9-7 flying demon with like hasty evasion is super sweet. And I've been in love with this card in this deck. I would highly recommend you play it. It's just one additional card that spices it up and it synergizes with Field of the Dead and your commander, meaning you get additional token generation at a later stage easier. So give Westvale Abbey a try if you're interested in more of a unique land to include in your deck. So importantly, our commander is four mana, meaning we have a lot of things in the two mana slot to ramp our commander out the very next turn. Now, you don't always have to play your commander. Like for instance, if you have the cards in your hand to make the strip lock possible, you're probably just gonna do that at an early stage of the game. However, it's important for us to recognize that being able to tutor out reliably a dual land or triome, et cetera, that is going to fix us on turn two to then play our commander on turn three reliably is very important. So we're playing the nature's lore effects, the far seeks, all that good stuff. And then on top of that, we have, yes, like I mentioned before, all the cards that allow us to play additional lands on our turns as well and have access to, for instance, playing off the top deck, et cetera, to get to those extra land drops every turn. This deck is uh, its more of a typical landfall build, but with the spice of having the Necro Bloom in the command zone, which is why I wanted to prioritize getting it out reliably at least on turn four. Did I say turn four? I meant turn three. You know what I meant. And yeah, I could sit here and talk about Dark Ritual and Cabal Ritual, but I want to spend just a second to talk about Culling Ritual. <laughs> so Culling Ritual is four mana. It's two in Golgari for a sorcery, and basically it reads Destroy All. I believe it's non-land permanence with mana value two or less. And yeah, that means tokens. It will probably also hit your tokens, but this is the trade-off that we're going for. Being able to ramp because we're in a landfall deck faster than everybody else. Maybe we have our commander out and let's say it's turn four or five and people are starting to get their things set up. They have their mana rocks, they have their soul ring, they have maybe some treasure tokens, etc. Being able to play a culling ritual that does not get countered at an early stage basically cements the game for you. It is an incredibly brutal card to play against. Uh, there's also in my particular deck list not a ton of things that can get blown up by our own calling ritual really the most collateral damage that's going to happen are from our tokens which again we actually will be happy in most circumstances to sacrifice them because guess what calling ritual makes a green or black mana for each permanent that was destroyed this way i was going to say killed same thing right but in our circumstance it's extra good we get more mana to pump our bigger plays and then effectively this ritual oftentimes makes way more than four mana typically in my experience like five to eight even as early as something like a turn four or five so this card is excellent i would really encourage you to give it a run in the deck and it's cheap it's probably going to make it into both deck lists including the more budgetary list just because it's only like 50 cents and the effect is just cataclysmic if we get it off at the right time now i could sit here pretty much all day and talk your ear off regarding the you know, consistency includes and other cards that make this deck sort of tick. You know, you can find any other channel to do that. I want to talk to you about some of the new cards that have come out recently that got me really excited about this list. And I've been really impressed by even in the more high powered version of the Necro Bloom. Let's start off by talking about Aftermath Analyst. So Aftermath Analyst is a two mana, one three elf detective. And the elf part matters a lot here for another card that I'm going to go over. But when ETBs, we mill three. That is just great in this deck. You know, effectively, it's like a Stitcher's supplier, but with a crazy amount of upside. Because the other effect, I just have to read it here, is three and a green to sacrifice this card, colon, return all land cards from your, to, from your graveyard to the battlefield tapped. So basically, this is a splendid reclamation on a body, and importantly, it is an elf. So let's talk about why it's important for it to be an elf. This card has so many abilities on it, I just have to pull it up here on my phone to read it. It is Nissa, Resurgent Animist for two and a green. You get an elf scout for 3-3 three, three with landfall. Whenever a land ETBs under your control, you make one mana of any color. So it's a Lotus Cobra for one extra mana, essentially. It generates land every single time you play one or a land enters under your control. That means fetch lands, for instance, are extra good in this circumstance. But in addition to that, it has then 
If it's the second time this ability has resolved this turn, reveal cards from the top of your library until you reveal an elf or elemental. Put it into your hand and the rest go on the bottom of your library in a random order. So this is sort of like a mini tutor. I purposely left out certain cards, certain elementals, like royal, ele or I'm sorry, not royal elemental, some of the other elemental cards that could synergize with this card purposefully because I wanted to ensure we're going to hit some of our key elves. And getting an aftermath analyst is actually pretty cracked because this card is going to probably be playable immediately upon hitting it off of Nissa's ability because we're going to be generating extra mana off of Nissa for our land drops. So let's say we have Nissa on the battlefield. We've tapped out. We play a fetch land that triggers once. We fetch away and we get our shock land, let's say. And when that land enters, we generate another mana. And then we reveal until we hit an elf or elemental. If it is the Aftermath Analyst, guess what? We just get to play it with the two mana that we just made, milling us and then continuing our game plan in a big way. It's a great card. And then the Splendid Reclamation that's tacked onto this is just incredible. <laughs> like I have been so impressed with this card because it's relatively innocuous. Most people don't want to remove it. And then having Splendid Reclamation more reliably, especially because we have cards like the Nissa in our deck, really gets my gears going. Like it makes decks like this tick in better, more consistent ways. And I would really encourage you to give it a try if you have not yet. Up next is a, a new card that actually just got printed. It is a, a riff on an oldie, but a goodie. This is white of the reliquary. It is Golgari, so it is black green for a 2-2 Vigilant Zombie Knight, and it gets plus one, plus one for each creature in your graveyard, but that's not why we're playing it. We're playing it for the next ability where you can tap, sacrifice another creature, mind you it does not need to be non-token, and then search your library for a land, put it onto the battlefield tapped, and then shuffle. So look, this card obviously by itself kind of sucks, but we have so many ways in our deck to generate tokens. And to be fair, there's a lot of like lower costed stuff that we don't mind being in the graveyard. So if we sacrifice like even one of our regular creatures, we're not that hurt. But most of the time in my experience, I'm sacrificing a token, like a zero one plant to just crop rotation. Like that is ridiculous. And on top of that, the white actually scales okay into the mid to late game because you guessed it, it gets plus one, plus one for all the creatures. So if we continuously mill ourselves and we have access to our graveyard, if we don't get Pajuka bogged, et cetera, the white actually gets pretty big. And on top of that, it allows us to continuously fetch lands out of our, out of our deck, including some of the key ones like, yes, strip mine or the, the field of the dead or glacial chasm, whatever you need in that circumstance, the white gets it for you. This card's been very impressive, and I think that it's going to continue to creep up in price because of how impressive it is. So I would give this card a look if you're building the Necrobloom. This is another card that's actually come out very recently. It is Turn Timber Sower. It's a three mana elf druid. Again, there's some elf synergy here, and it's a three three. Whenever one or more land cards cards are put into your graveyard from anywhere, so this could be milled, create a zero one green plant. And then you can pay green and sacrifice three creatures, return target land card from your graveyard to your hand. So this card's sweet. I've been really impressed by it pretty much every time that I've used it because there's a lot of self mill and there's a lot of dredging going on with our commander. So if for instance, we dredge a land while this is on the battlefield already, we just get to incidentally make an additional plant. And on top of that, we're running tons of fetch lands in our list, at least in the more expensive version. And those fetch lands put in a ton of work in landfall decks. For those of you that know, you know, but in this circumstance, we get the plant just from us fetching with our fetch lands anyway. And of course it has the abuse potential of sacrificing tokens. It's just really good. I would give this card a look for sure. Now there are so many more great cards to talk about in this list, but I'm gonna have to cut it down for time reasons. A lot of it is just the generic good landfall stuff, but I wanna talk about one more new card that's come out recently that I think you'll find very impressive and that is just six. Not Renin six, it's just six. This is a three mana, two and a green for a legendary tree folk, two four with reach, and it has whenever it attacks, you mill three cards and you put, may put a land from among them into your hand. And as long as it's your turn, non-land permanent cards in your graveyard have retrace, and that is 
so good. You may cast permanent cards from your graveyard by discarding a land in addition to paying their other costs. And we just went over, we have cards in the deck like the, uh, what is it, Turn Timber Sower, which is going to just get incidental value off of us discarding a card to the graveyard in order to recast something that we didn't want to be there. I have various effects in the deck. I have a small reanimator package, for instance, that allows us to get key cards back, or if we mill something like our Moonshaker Cavalry or our Crater Hoof Behemoth, etc., you can just get it back. And six is just sort of that additional reassurance that we are going to have access to that, but it's actually on a body. So I've been very impressed with this card as well. It's another one of those ones from MH3 where it could creep up even higher in price. It's in the rare slot. So maybe give six a look uh, in the near future if you're looking to build the Necro Bloom. All right, let's transition over to talk about the more budgetary lists. So in the budget list, there's a few cards in particular that I just want to highlight because I don't really see them get much play. And actually, I've really loved them and I've even considered putting them in my higher power list just to sort of spice things up and show people cards that we don't normally get to see at our games of Commander. The first one is Life and Death, or Life or Death. And it's a, a split card, so you can either pay green for a sorcery, and all lands you control become 1-1 one, one creatures, they're still lands. Or you can cast this for Death, which is a 1 and black sorcery. Return target creature from your graveyard to the battlefield, and then you lose life equal to its mana value. So it's basically uh, one extra mana for a reanimate. And it turns out that this card is insanely cheap. A reanimate is like anywhere from like five USD upwards to like 15, just depending on when it's been reprinted, whatever. This card's like 15 cents. And yes, it's in Golgari colors, but it also has this subtle land synergy where we get to turn our lands into creatures if we need to sort of cross the finish line. And it has the flexibility to reanimate if we need to. This card's really good, so I'd give it a look, especially, I'm hoping I'm turning you on to this card for the first time, because it's really good, and I think that you'll be very impressed with it when you play it. Up next is another Golgari split card. It is Driven Despair, or Driven to Despair. So this is an Aftermath card, so you have to cast the green side first, but then you can cast it for the Aftermath once it's in your graveyard. And the first part is Driven, which is two mana, one and a green for a sorcery. Until end of turn, creatures you control gain Trample, and... Whenever it deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. That's super good. Two mana for that effect at a later stage in the game with a bunch of zombie tokens turns into refilling your hand and more in a budget pod. And then on top of that, there is despair. <laughs> so once it's in your graveyard, you want to cast it for one in a black and it reads, until end of turn, creatures you control gain menace. And whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, that player discards a card. Again, if we have a wide board, we can effectively just empty all of our opponent's hands and on top of that, draw our own. It's a really good card. It's four mana to basically cast both. And you know what? It Again, it's one of those cards where it's subtly, it doesn't look like it might, but it really does end games, especially if you already have somewhat of an existing board. You can even just play it at an earlier stage in the game to draw a couple extra cards if that's sort of what you need in that moment. I've been impressed by it. Give it a look. So I just have two more that I want to go over. First and foremost is Woodland Bellower. Now, if I'm, some of you might be familiar with this card already. It's six mana, four green green for a beast. It's six five. Whenever it enters the battlefield, you may search your library for a non-legendary green creature with converted mana cost three or less, put it onto the battlefield, and then shuffle your library. So this card used to be an absolute like boogeyman, even in formats like Canadian Highlander, for instance, where it's some of the most powerful cards ever printed. It turns out tutoring out a green creature with a mana cost of three, which is excellent by the way and just being able to put it onto the battlefield is an insane effect and as mentioned we have lots of sort of reanimation pieces this card is going to be easy to get onto the battlefield either from us ramping out really fast or from us just reanimating it because we milled it into the yard so if we need a regrowth effect something to get it back into our hand guess what we can just get e-witness right out of our deck and then get something back into our hand right away. We can play the aforementioned Aftermath Analysis. We can also grab a White of the Reliquary or a Knight of the Reliquary. We can play one of the new cards that was recently printed, printed which is Dune Chanter. And that card, for those of you that don't know, is three mana, two and a green for a plant druid, two, three with reach. Lands you control and lands that you own that aren't on the battlefield are deserts in addition to their other types. 
and lands you control have tapped to add one mana of any color. And if that's not enough, you can tap this card to mill two and you gain one life for each land that was milled in this manner. So another good hit off of the Bellower. You can also just hit one of the Provisioners if you want, like the Tireless Provisioner or Tireless Tracker. You can also get one of the new cards that was printed in the recent Fallout set, which is Tato Farmer, and that is two and a green for a 1-4 with Landfall. Whenever a land enters the battlefield, you may get two rad counters. Tap, put target land in a graveyard that was milled this turn onto the battlefield tapped under your control. I'm going to get exasperated if I keep going. There are just a ton of really good targets for the Bellower in our deck. And I've been impressed by this card pretty much every time I've used it. I think that it's one of those ones that is... How do I want to say this? It It's probably going to surprise some people because they probably have never seen it before. And it's a great callback that sort of gives people nostalgia for a format when they see it played on your side of the table. I've just seen it sort of result in a lot of feel feel good type of moments if that sounds right because people go oh yeah I remember that card back when I used to play it in x format or oh man I can't believe people still play that card or whatever and it results in more good moments in my experience when you kind of go back in time and pick some of these cool cards out of the muck and then the last one that I want to talk about is actually not a new card by any means it's a it's an old card but it recently got reprinted and it's the lowest cost that it has been ever since I started playing and it's under realm lich it is three in golgari so five mana you get a zombie elf shaman that's a 4-3. And if you would draw a card, instead, look at the top three of your library. Oh, I'm already, I'm already excited. And then put one into your hand and the rest into your graveyard. And you can pay four life. Underrealm Lich gains indestructible until end of turn and tap it. So it has built-in protection, which is great. But really, we're playing it for that other effect where if you would draw... It's a replacement effect where you look at the top three and then can dump them into the graveyard if you so choose. That effect is insane. This card almost single-handedly has basically pushed me over the finish line to win games. Being able to effectively get whatever lands that I need either into my hand or into the graveyard because it gives you that selection is really key for a deck like this. And again, I just mentioned it was reprinted. It's like a dollar to like a dollar fifty USD right now. It used to be like 10 to 15 bucks or something like that before the reprint came out in the clue edition and you can see why this card is really good especially in a budget sort of setting at this time because it's so cheap i would really encourage you to give it a look and pick it up if you're looking to build the budgetary format of this deck now i risk of making this video like over an hour long because i could just keep just gushing about cards that I find really exciting or have been really impressive for like my deck builds. I'm going to call it here. You can check out both of my deck lists down in the description below. You can get both access to the budget version and also the higher powered version. If you're playing the high powered version, I will say this, it's definitely not like a competitive list by any means, but it's really impressive. It can do some absolutely degenerate things game after game, and it's very consistent, which is sort of what I was aiming for with those higher powered lists. So if you're interested in that type of ceiling, I would definitely give the higher powered list a look. And I also just want to take a moment to thank everybody who's tuned in the last couple of days to watch my my week long series of content, uh, you know, early Christmas and June, whatever you want to call it. And it feels really validating when people watch the videos and they connect with them and they like them. And it means a lot to me. So if you like this video, I'd love to hear it down in the description below with a with a comment. Did I say description? Down in the comments below. That's what I meant to say. And let me know what you thought about this video and if you're going to build this commander. As always, subscribing goes a long way as well. So if you could subscribe to the channel, I'd really appreciate it. And on top of that, if you can check out my Patreon, because my patrons got access to these lists early and they got a full text breakdown of what I am doing to build this commander. So if you're interested in getting access to these deck lists early and then, you know, of course, getting my detailed sort of thoughts about how this deck functions and key cards to include or exclude, you want to go over to my Patreon and subscribe over there. Uh, free members will also get access to it after the video has released. But if you want the early access, you have to subscribe to the Patreon. As always, I've been Kyle. Thank you all so much for watching. And I'll see you tomorrow for yet another video. I'll see you there. And until next time, bye.